Thank you very much and welcome. <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to talk to you about badges. And um, I'm trying to come outside and do this. I hope it's not too dark. It's not the brightest day in the world, but um, we'll see how we get on. But at least I can talk to you about badges. I don't know what's going on, but um, yeah. it's not the right step, right? Yeah. So I just do it. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic Dyer. I'm chief executive of the Badger Trust. And I also work for a charity called the Born Free Foundation, doing UK wildlife work and international wildlife policy work for them as well. I'm here today um, for Lizzie Daly's Earth Live session to talk to you for the next 15 minutes or so and take some questions as well about badgers. Uh, badgers have been a, a very important part of my life for many years in terms of campaigning for wildlife. Um, the badger is our largest surviving carnivore, believe it or not. Uh, here in Britain, we don't have wolves, we don't have bears anymore. We might have lynx coming back soon if they are brought back under rewilding projects, which I'm very excited about. But in the meantime, the badger is our largest surviving carnivore. And it's an incredible animal, but most of us never really see badgers alive. Unfortunately, most of us only see them dead by the side of the road. And one of the reasons for that is that badgers are primarily nocturnal. They live underground in badger sets. Um, they don't move around in daylight very often. And unfortunately, because they tend to move across roads following vapor trails that uh, basically they follow for generations from one group of badgers to another, uh, they get knocked down regularly on our busy roads, both at night and in the early morning. And that's when most of us see them. Um, if you ever get the experience of watching badgers, and I've been very fortunate to do that at various badger sets around the country, it's an incredibly wonderful experience. They are an amazing animal. 
And I really want to tell you a bit more about them today and a bit about some of the threats that they face as well. Let me start with um, this. This is a cuddly Steiff Badger, the German, very well-known cuddly toy company. Uh, this one was purchased from an antiques market a few years ago. Um, and we have it in the office at the Badger Trust and we sometimes bring it to school to show children. And it's a beautiful reproduction, really, I would say, in terms of a cuddly animal of a badger. But believe it or not, the size is not that far out. So there we go. That's actually a cuddly badger. But behind me here, I have a real badger. This one um, was purchased as a taxidermy badger, of course. Um, probably died on the road looking at a see from an injury on its head. This was purchased in an antique shop in Brighton a few years ago and we used for educational purposes for the Badger Trust. Uh, but it does give you an idea of what badgers look like when they're alive and, and how impressive these animals are. They have amazing claws. I don't know if you can see that. I'm just putting that right up here. You can just see how powerful their claws are. They are very low squat muscular animals, amazing diggers. Uh, their sets can last effectively for hundreds of years. Uh, they're amazingly constructed. The tunnels go up and down and they can you know, travel out for, for tens, 20, 30 meters in different directions, different entry and exit points. And in some areas, badgers will live between two or three different sets. So they sort of move from one home to the other. If floods happen, badgers will move out of their sets. They've even been known to climb up trees and stay in that area before, until the flood water drops and they can return back down again. Uh, they have amazingly strong skulls. Um, if you ever see badger skulls and you will find them often where badgers have died near sets. You will see the skull will still be there and they are collected by people that are really interested in badger ecology. But they're incredibly strong, they have very strong jaws, but they can take a big knock to their head. And in some cases, cars will hit badgers and sort of knock them out and they will come around again and uh, be off on their merry way. But a lot of the time badgers are injured. Um, the Badger Trust, the work charity I work for, has lots of different groups up and down the country that will rescue badgers that are injured or rescue badger cubs that are left when they're Mothers are killed, unfortunately, on the road and get them to wildlife sanctuaries like Tiggy Winkles, which is quite near where I live here in Buckinghamshire, or Folly Wildlife Rescue, or Vale, other well-known centres around the country, and get those badgers back into the wild. So that's a very important part of the work that we do at the Badger Trust. An amazing animal. But we have a love-hate relationship with badgers, I'm afraid. Um, it's an animal that's beautiful, of course. It's an animal that, if you look at it, it's impressive, it's strong, it's resilient. But some people are quite fearful of it. Over the years you know we've had lots of connections with badgers in our popular culture and our landscapes we've had books written like winds in the willows which was a, a very famous book written in the 1930s that as you know mr badger was a key part of that children's book you've had you know companies like tesco with its coats of arms has a badger in it uh, when jr um, rowling wrote um, Harry Potter, Hogwarts, coats of arms, has a badger in it as well. Badgers do turn up in the most amazing places. We have lots of towns and, and, and villages named after badgers in Britain. So they've been an important part of our history, but also we've had a lot of persecution of this species as well. Um, traditionally, badgers have not had protection um, until quite recently under the law. And what we found is lots of people would take dogs and fight dogs against badgers. This was something that we would have found in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. If you were traveling in inns from one part of the country to the other, you would find that badgers would be tethered by chains and people would gamble on them fighting with dogs. Horrible. As you went into the sort of turn of the century, the, the 1920s and 30s, more widespread use of dogs going down badgers for badger baiting. And this was really what a, a lot of people got very concerned about particularly in the post-war era, is that the scale of destruction of badger sets and the persecution was really endangering the species. And the first badger protection groups really came about because people went to where their sets were and they literally sat on top of those sets at night to stop the badger baiters coming on. In places like the Wirral in Cheshire, in the southwest of England, those first badger groups in the 1960s and early 70s became very important. And that led to discussions in Parliament and then what was called a private members bill was put forward. And in 1973, badgers actually got protection under the law for the first time. And that legislation in due course has been strengthened by the Wildlife and Countryside Act in the 1980s and the Badger Protection Act in the 1990s. So the animal actually now under law has a lot of protection uh, in terms of people that might try and abuse or persecute it or try and destroy its sets, its home effectively. But despite that protection, it still remains one of the most persecuted animals in Britain today. So at the Badger Trust, we work very hard to educate people young and old, to try and ensure that people understand that badgers are not a threat, they are beautiful animals, and to try and work with the police, for example, in training them to deal with badger persecution. So what we do is we actually have training courses for police officers up and down the country. 
Uh, we will tell them about badger behavior and ecology. We'll tell them about how the law works with regards to badger protection. We take them out to badger sets and we will tell them about what the situation is with regards to persecution, what they need to look for if someone's been tampering with the set. And that works very important because it's led to evidence being compiled and, and people being brought to court for breaking the law and badger persecution. And that's a very important ongoing piece of work for us. But the other big debate about badgers, of course, is about the farming industry. Now, at the moment, we're facing a pandemic. All of us are very familiar with what we're having to deal with by like being at home and what's happening around the world. And there's lots of discussion about vaccination and tracing people with disease. But actually, that debate's been going on in the badger world for nearly 40 years. The problem we have is that we have an intensive system of rearing cattle for milk production in Britain, as we do in many other parts of the world. That intensive system means we have many cows that are kept inside damp conditions for many months of the year, and they spread a disease called TB from cow to cow. And TB is something that has been in our herd, our cattle systems, for, for many, many decades. But at certain times, the disease has spiked and got worse and spread from one herd to another. Unfortunately, the badger has often been blamed for the spread of that disease. Now, there's two things that we know. We know that TB can spread from a cow to badgers to foxes, to stoats, weasels, rats, and domestic animals as well. It spills over, almost as a form of pollution from the farming systems into wildlife and domestic animals. What we don't really have is lots of strong evidence to prove that badgers can pass the disease back to cattle. Not certain that it can't. There's no doubt that in some cases it probably does. But there's not strong scientific evidence to show that is the major factor. I'm afraid, though, the debate in terms of government and the farming industry and the veterinary industry has been very much over the last 40 years focused on blaming the badger for the spread of the disease. And what we've seen over that period of time is lots of different policies implemented by government. To begin with, it involved gassing, which was very cruel and was finally outlawed in 1980. And then we've gone on to see animals being trapped and shot. Um, but a lot of badgers have been killed. And over the last seven years, since 2013, the government has had a badger policy, a badger culling policy, which has now resulted in over 100,000 badgers being killed from zones in Cornwall all the way up to Cambria, so over 40 different areas of the country now. Now the Badger Trust and other charities like the Wildlife Trust and National Trust and the RSPCA have worked very hard to try and say to government and the farming industry that we should have a better way. And just like the pandemic discussions we're having at the moment, we're talking about vaccination. So vaccination for people is important, vaccination for animals is as well. So what we're able to do with badgers is use the same vaccine we use on people to lower TB. We use BCG vaccine. We just use it at a, a, a stronger content level, stronger dose level. Badgers are quite easy to trap as well. They're, they're quite lazy animals in many ways. So they're quite happy to go into a trap if we lay bait out it a few days and they get used to where it is. And then the trap door can be dropped and the animal will sleep in the cage overnight and wait for someone to release it in the morning. The tragedy about the badger call policy is what happens is the people that come to kill the badgers will, will come in the morning and not release them. They will shoot them, which is horrible and cruel in our view. Whereas if we vaccinate them, people will come back to the badgers in the morning and they will actually vaccinate the badgers with a needle in the same way that we vaccinate a person and the badger is released. And we know from scientific evidence that the government has commissioned that if we do that, we can reduce the spread of the disease in those badgers by about 70 percent. And also that follows on to the newborn cubs as well. So there's a real benefit. The other good thing, of course, about badger vaccination is it brings farmers and it brings wildlife conservationists, people like me, together where we actually value wildlife. We don't sort of take a, a decision where we kill animals without considering the impact that has. And I think that's terribly important when we come to talk about the future of our landscapes and our wildlife. Because here in Britain, as much as it's very beautiful and green, and many of us are enjoying the countryside more than ever now at the moment, this is still one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. You know, in the last 50 years, you know, since I was born, intensive agriculture systems and, and, and modern systems of farming and pesticide use and the removal of hedgerows has led to many animals disappearing, birds and mammals. We've seen towns expand. The green belt has been gradually removed across wide parts of the country, which had a huge impact on, on wild animals as well. And climate change, of course, which is the biggest threat that faces the future of mankind, even if we're considering this short term pandemic we're facing, is having a huge impact in Britain and around the world on habitats. And again, and leading to significant declines of these animals. So badgers are an important part of the ecosystem. And uh, I just want to show you a wonderful book by Michael Clark, which is, uh, if you ever want to find out about badgers, Michael's a wonderful naturalist and illustrator. And this book was originally produced in the 1980s and has recently been reissued. Um, 
But in here, he has a, a beautiful selection of drawings, his own drawings about all the different badgers that we see in the world, different badgers that we'll find in different locations. Some of you will be very familiar with the honey badger. The honey badger is one of the most incredible predators in Africa. Ferocious, extremely brave and strong. It's also to be found in the Middle East and other parts of the world as well. It'll see off hyenas, it will see off lions. It's not terrified of anything. And actually a funny story about this, in, in the Iraq war in 2003, after the war had ended in Basra, where the British army were basically occupying that city for a period of time, honey badgers came out of the desert into the town and started going through the bins. But the local people were so worried, they called the British army out with their armored cars. They didn't harm the badgers at all, but they were just very scared of these animals. They actually won't do any harm to, 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 to humans, but they are very, very strong. So they can turn over bins and they can push things around and they're not afraid of anything. And here we are. This is the European badger, which is the badger I've just shown you, which is the one that we have in Britain and across Europe. In my view, probably the most handsome of all badgers, although I love them all as in animals. Um, this is an American badger here, a North American badger. If you can see this one. It's a bit of a punk rocker badger, this one. Um, it, it looks very different to our European badgers, but it, it's a wonderful badger as well. And um, we have different badgers in different parts of the world. We have the Chinese ferret badger at the bottom here, you can see. The Palawian stink badger here as well, that you can see at the top. So lots of different animals, all wonderful in their own right. And there's been lots of wonderful books written about badgers as well. Um, and if you want to find out about them, I'll recommend a few Badgerlands by Patrick Barkham who writes for the Guardian newspaper, a wonderful na nature writer. This was his book that he wrote a number of years ago about his experiences of growing up with people that love badgers, of going to watch badgers, and also that influence, as I said earlier, about badgers on our history and our culture and our landscapes and our, our relationship with them, the love-hate relationship we've had with this animal. Wonderful book, well worth reading. This is my book, so I will recommend it. If you want to find out about some of the issues I talked about, badgers and farming, this was written a number of years ago. It's called Badger to Death because I was really trying to get across how these animals have been demonized and blamed for a spread of disease in cattle that I think actually is not their fault. And we must find better ways to resolve that problem. So that was really written about that issue as well, which was important. Michael Clark's book, as I said earlier, I think is excellent and it's well worth reading. There are many other books about badgers as well. So there's, there's no shortage of finding out about them. The Badger Trust is a charity, a national charity that has been in existence for over 30 years. And we do wonderful work protecting badgers, rescue rehabilitation of badgers, educating people about badgers, working with the police protecting badgers. Um, you can join the Badger Trust, go to our website. We have a, a packs for young people as well, education packs and, and, and lots of things there just to sort of give you an opportunity to learn more about them. And if you join your local badger group or get involved, you can actually go and see these wonderful animals. There are lots of badger hides up and down the country. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that if you, you know, have the time and you do it properly and carefully and you're not disturbing the badgers and the hides are set up for you to do that, then you can watch them by moonlight up and down the country. And it's one of the most wonderful experiences you'll ever have in terms of wildlife. And there's some great young wildlife naturalists out there. Alex White, I think, has done one of the videos recently for Lizzie. Um, his book, Get Your Boots On. Uh, Alex is a wonderful wildlife photographer, blogger and writer and his book just sort of tells you his experience of falling in love with nature from a young age and he's done some wonderful videos on badgers in fact we've got um, a debate on badgers for the mail online which will be um, online on monday and i think alex's footage some of his film will be used in, in in that particular piece as well which i think will be wonderful to see so you know badgers are an important animal but they are an animal that's caught up in the debate about our modern farming systems about protection of the environment the other thing i would say about badgers and if i come back to my Badger here to finish with is they're not the most easiest animals to deal with if we get in their way. Badgers will never cause us any problems unless we cause them problems, but they do dig and they can, you know, cause problems for humans. They can dig under football pitches, they can destabilize roads, they can cause problems in people's gardens. A lot of what we do as the Badger Trust is try and tell people that there are ways by which we can live side by side with badgers. We don't want to hurt them. And we say to a lot of building developers, you must follow the law on badger protection, because if you push badgers away from where they're living, they will turn up somewhere else and that will cause problems. We have badgers in our towns and cities, um, increasingly in places like London and Birmingham, we have badgers. I know there was one scene at Sheffield Station, I think last week, which was all over social media because it was wandering across the platform, but that was probably a badger set quite close by to the station, believe it or not. And badgers can live very well in urban areas as well as in the countryside, but they are an amazingly powerful, strong, resilient animal that has suffered greatly at our hands, but an animal that I think we should treasure, an animal that I think we need to protect for the future. I love them. 
I think you'll fall in love with them the more you learn about them as well. And I hope this little session today has just taught you a little bit more about the world of the Badger. Thank you very much. I think I might just have a one or two questions I will quickly try and respond to. Um, let me just see what we've got here. We've got um, Mike Dixon. Why do so many people want to eradicate badgers? Um, I said, I think, Mike, the problem you have is, is a lot of the um, attitudes and concerns about badgers are passed from one generation to the next. So we have to educate people. I think, unfortunately, in the farming community, it's difficult. You know, if you're a livestock farmer, a dairy farmer, bovine TB is a major social economic problem for farmers. And if they blame the badger or their fathers told them it was the badger or the vets tell them it's the badger, it's very difficult to change that opinion. I think we are achieving some of a breakthrough with some farmers, particularly on badger vaccination projects in places like Derbyshire, where a huge amount of work is going on in the southwest in Cornwall and other places as well. And when you build a relationship with a farmer and they understand badgers, if you put, for example, camera traps down by the sets, by their fields, they can see the badgers living there. When they come out and actually help us dig in the cages for the vaccination, they come and watch the vaccination. They bring their children sometimes. And rather than hating badgers, they become guardians of them. And I think that's really good to see as well. Uh, Alex Cunningham, you said here that the government plans to eventually phase out the badger call. Yes, they do. Um, we're pleased that they have said they want to move to badger vaccination and cattle vaccination. This is the other big issue they have to address. If we can vaccinate both cattle and badgers, improve the testing for TB in the herds and the movement and biosecurity controls on farms, I've no doubt we can get on top of this disease without killing wildlife. The tragedy is that we're going to see a lot more badgers killed over probably the next four or five years till we get to that point. Even this year with the pandemic we're facing, we've said to the government we think we should stop badger culling, but they've told us this week that they plan to continue to go ahead with it. So we've still got a long battle on our hands at the moment to protect these animals as well. I think the other question I would say about badgers is that, you know, people often claim that they kill hedgehogs. Um, badgers will predate on hedgehogs. They predominantly eat earthworms, snails, slugs, but they will eat ground nesting bumblebees and they will, will eat hedgehogs, but they don't predominantly eat hedgehogs. The problem for hedgehogs is not badgers, it's humans. Our farming systems, our removal of hedgerows, the use of strimmers, hedgehogs like badgers being killed on the roads, the fences in our gardens that prevent them moving across from one area to another. Hedgehog numbers are now well below a million. And if anything happens you know, to them in the future, I think they could be in danger of particularly local extinction. Of course, badgers predate on them and they have more impact because the numbers are so low. But if, if, the, if the hedgehog population was healthy and humans treated hedgehogs better, then whatever badgers took would have little impact. And I think that's, that's the way that we must do it as well. Yes, um, Emily Lawrence has asked me just to mention about the whole issue of, of fox hunts. Um, we do have ongoing problems about hunting. Um, the F Hunting Act has been on the, the statute book since 2004, but there are many loopholes that allow foxes to still be killed. And I'm afraid hunts do go out and they do fill in badger sets to stop the, the hounds going off the scent or down the set. Um, and that is illegal. And that's something we're working with League Against Cruel Sports and the police to stamp out and also working with government ministers to make it clear we want to see that end as well which is important. So I think I'm almost at my 20 minutes uh, and I've seen all the questions we have here. Uh, I think I've, I've uh, answered most of them. I hope you found the session useful. I know being in my garden on a grey day, it's not rain, which has been great. So my view would be this. If you're interested in badgers, get some more reading material, find out more about the Badger Trust, come on a badger watch, join your local badger protection group, treasure these animals, stand up and protect them. It's really important. I'd like to say thank you to Lizzie. I know she's a great champion for wildlife protection at home and abroad, a wonderful filmmaker. And I, I think at this difficult time, uh, the whole live stream set up um, this Earth Live program platform that has given so many people like me an opportunity to talk to, to young people around the world has been fantastic. So well done. Keep up the wonderful work. Uh, and I look forward to working with you, Lizzie, again, when we all come out of cyberspace and we all meet each other again, in which I hope will be happier and safer times. Stay safe, everyone. Let's value the natural world. We need to make this world a better place for people and animals and keep up the great work. Thank you. Bye bye.